welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Um, I was just looking at the description of the event, which is that Constanza will talk about what is happening in America and to transatlantic relations. How should Europe respond? She will explore the state of transatlantic relations, including German-US relations, the future of NATO, and current challenges to the EU-US relationship. The speaker will speak for 20 minutes. Right. So I thought that would be, you know, <laughs> that would be good. Level, as we say so um, I think there's a lot to cover. I think our time in inviting our chance to come uh, is very good, and I think we can look forward to a, a very interesting uh, event. Most of you, I think, know Dr. Stelson Muller, who is the inaugural Robert Bosch Senior Fellow in the Centre on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institute. And she's a governor of the Ditchley Foundation and a fellow of the Royal Swedish Society for War Sciences. She's a doctorate from Bonn and a master's degree from Harvard. So. <laughs> <laughs> All of which, uh, as you can see, you know, gives me infinite authority on whatever, you know, whatever I say. Um, well, thank you very much. It's lovely to be reinvited. That suggests I didn't you know, uh, do everything wrong last time. And it is a, uh, it's lovely to be in Dublin. Um, I wish I had more time, um, but I'm particularly grateful, not just for the warm reception um, and for the excellent egg sandwich I just had, um, but also for the lovely weather. Um, that's quite something. It's been sort of Siberian in Washington um, for, for quite a long time. It's, the spring has just broken out there as well, but this is good. I'm about done with winter. So um, the reason why I gave you such an incredibly general all over the map title um, when we decided, uh, when you asked me for one, was that I sort of never know from one week uh, to the other what, you know, what's going to be going on in Washington. It's, it's really one, one of the sort of uh, facts of life of living in Washington and trying to understand what's going on and pontificating about it afterwards is that um, you, know, you so often sit there and pinch yourself and say, did that just really happen? Um, and what the hell does this mean now? Um, so, um, with that caveat, you know that I could be wrong in a week, or something, you know, something else happens, and, we, you know, and everything shifts. Um, let me give you um, sort of twenty minutes worth of what I think, what right, right, what my thinking is today, this morning, in Dublin. Um, I went to the Munich Security Conference, which is sort of, people like me, is a key bellwether of what's going on in the Transatlantic Alliance and other relationships. Um, and I was also in Washington last week for, for the NATO um, shindig. Um, and if you went to those two, um, you could probably think, you'd be excused for thinking that, well, this, you know, wasn't, you know, in German you would say, Aber er hat doch gar nicht gebohrt, you know, the dentist wasn't that bad. Um, in Munich, for example, people had still had a searing memory of last year's Munich Security Conference, where you just had an incredibly glum sense that the Western order was falling apart and nobody knew what to do about it and nobody had an answer to the challenges and to the disruption coming out of Washington. Um, this time, at least, um, you had uh, a, I have to say, really robotic speech from the vice president in which he um, essentially, you know, the essential message was our way or the highway. Yeah. Um, but you had a really feisty and spirited response from Angela Merkel which uh, she got standing ovations for, something that is quite rare in Washington, uh, in, in Munich. And you had a speech from Joe Biden reassuring everybody, no, the other half of America still loves you. And you had, I think most importantly, um, a historically large congressional delegation um, that went out of its way to engage with Europeans and others um, that um, was very, sort of very very present, visible, and very determined to, um, to make an impact. And it pains to demonstrate support. And then at the NATO anniversary meeting in DC, 
Um, I sort of at the last minute got an invitation to <coughs> listen to uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg's speech in the rotunda in the Capitol, uh, which is really quite unusual. I had never done that before, and I have to say it was most impressive, not least, not least having to na navigate what seemed like kilometers of tunnels underneath the Capitol to get up into the, the visitor's gallery. Um, and then you had, you had a secretary general who really gave a good and punchy speech, and a Congress that appeared to be determined on both sides of the aisle to show love and support. Um, he got, I think, standing ovations after every third sentence. I mean, we were literally sitting down, standing up, sitting down, standing up all the time. It was, became a little bit absurd, but after, you know, the, the, everybody was good natured and went along with it. But if you look closely, um, if you look closely, you'd see that, um, and I started counting empty seats on the Republican side, and there were 45 empty seats, and the Republicans did not get up every time the Democrats got up. And then you looked a little closer on the Democratic sides, and, and some of the people looked a little too young to be members of Congress, and I assumed that they had sent staff uh, kids and interns to take empty places as well. So you had to look. It was actually helpful to be there, as it so often is. Um, I then went to this, this reception where uh, Pompeo gave a quite warm pro NATO speech and uh, you know, stood there for a group picture with the foreign ministers. And all of that seemed to be reasonably cheerful. And of course, the key news item of that week was nobody left the alliance. You know? And I have to say, I think some of us, including me, had sort of been holding their breaths on that one because it would not have been difficult for the boss to have tweeted you know, that this was, that he had had it with all this pomp and ceremony. Um, and of course, this was a NATO ministerial, not a NATO heads of state summit in, on purpose so that the, the president wouldn't have an excuse to be there. Um, so I would say, on the whole, while this all, the optics of all this were okay, and nothing bad happened, I th I'd say that the impression of stability and harmony and agreement is deceptive. And I will try and explain why I think that and why I'm still actually really, really worried. Um, if you look at the state of transatlantic relations right now in the third year of Trump, I think you have to say that on both sides, um, things are looking pretty grim. You've got on the American side, transactionalism, coercion or threats of coercion, support for nationalists and authoritarians, not just in the rest of the world, but in Europe, notably the Hungarians. Um, but a lot of this is in a sort of state of suspension. I mean, we now have a new threat of economic sanctions vis-a-vis -vis the EU. And we'll see where that goes. But it's actually taken Washington surprisingly long to get to that point. And for the longest time, you had threats and repetitions of threats and more threats. But nothing really happened on those sanctions and coercion front. And that, I think, is, has been a notable part of the atmosphere there. It, was, it reminded me of what in World War II people used to call the drôle de guerre. Um, which, of course, was followed by a real guerre. Um, so that's maybe possible. I hope that's not an accurate association. The other thing that you see, of course, is that where the administration does carry out policies, they often end up bogged down in incoherence. And because there is less and less politically appointed staff, because there are so many vacancies, not just at the top levels, but at the <coughs> lower levels, and people are coming in as acting, um, as acting office holders um, who are sort of ripped out of another function or are actually too junior for that office and therefore can't be acting, <coughs> and sort of designated sort of placeholders until someone is found. And then you know, it takes a very long time for this to be filled. And the result of that is that on the levels underneath them, people sort of operate on autopilot without sort of not just without instructions, I think, but also without a sort of coherent sense of strategy. 
um, there is a, a general sense of incoherence about American foreign and security policy as a whole, that for somebody like me, who has been used to thinking about people who execute and make policy in America as sort of like nuclear engineers on the bridge of a big aircraft carrier or, or a big nuclear power plant, um, is really quite disconcerting. I mean, my experience of policy discussions in Washington is one of sort of very carefully calibrated, minuscule sort of adaptations um, of, uh, of policy and a general sort of unwillingness, except in sort of very remarkable circumstances, to avoid major disruptions. And here, of course, you have the opposite. Disru disruption is the rule, but it, but it so often remains oddly sort of non-embedded in, uh, in an overall framework or, or remains without consequence. On the European side, you have a variety of, of, of approaches from strategic autonomy to like-minded alliances, that of course is the German approach, uh, I, I think a quite healthy uh, increasing refusal to be triggered by everything that the president tweets in the morning, um, that I think is, a, is actually a good development. Um, and I think you also have a fair amount of, of diplomats um, on both sides, actually Americans and, and Europeans are to be believed in Washington, a fair amount of sort of very um, quiet but professional cooperation on sort of urgent and current issues um, underneath the, the waterline. But I think that we also need to see that the perception of Europe in Washington, and I think it is not inaccurate, sadly, is one of a, comp of a continent that is weakened by its own severe divisions on key policy issues, uh, that is also rarely capable of coherent approaches, that when it tries to produce coherent approaches, such as trying to resist the can cancellation of the JCPOA, um, the formation of a separate uh, Iranian um, uh, financial vehicle. Um, these things end up not really shifting Washingtonian policy. They end up petering out. And add to that, of course, any amount of national alignment, not least from my own country, forgive me for saying this, Ambassador, um, uh, all of us are capable of being nationalists, opportunists when we choose, and we do do this. And um, there is an abundance of national egoism uh, on view when you look at Europe from Washington. And I say that as a committed European. So what I think we have currently is something of an instable equilibrium of mostly inaction. And you have that in transatlantic relations, you have that in the relationship between what we used to think of, and I still think of as the West versus the rest, and you have it also domestically in the balance between mainstream politics and the populace. There, it's not a truth, certainly. Things haven't been settled, but they're sort of suspended in mid -air. And the reason why, why this worries me so much is that I think that I, I see the risk of the exhaustion and delegitimization of Western rules and institutions, of national democratic institutions being exhausted and delegitimized. That creates a vacuum for challenges and adversaries to exploit. It's very real. I see an increased risk of miscalculation, misinterpretation, accidental escalation. And if that weren't enough, what worries me most under these circumstances is the toxic impact left mostly unchecked of an increasingly hostile and dark narrative um, in America about Europe and indeed about Germany, <coughs> for which as I, I see some factual basis. I see things that one might be 
concerned about or angry about or just criticize in policy terms, but it is embedded in a sort of larger approach to, to the world that I find genuinely not just concerning but distressing and it actually makes me afraid. I, I, I don't say this lightly, but it makes me afraid for the future. Um, and here I, I've brought some things to quote at you. Um, some of you, or many of you, will have perhaps noted uh, or even read the Pompeo speech in Brussels, which got almost no coverage, oddly, in the American press, but of course was widely, was, was widely reviewed and commented on here, and in which, um, you will recall, he said um, that he thought, from what he could see, the EU was, you know, clearly sort of, an, inst an, 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 an institution headed by, by unelected bureaucrats. And then he said at, an, at another point that as far as this administration was concerned, they were there to protect nations and nationalists and sovereignty, and that institutional, international institutions that didn't protect the interests of nations and of people ought to be disassembled. And people in the room and elsewhere read this as exactly what it was meant to be, which was a very fundamental critique of the EU. Um, you add that to the president's known penchant for tweeting, for referring to the EU as a foe, and you have reason to be concerned. Um, now, you will presumably know, Ambassador, that um, there, have, there have been reports coming out of Washington um, that the recently departed most senior Europe um, diplomat in Washington, Wes Mitchell, um, told German diplomats that if they wanted to have a general explanation, a blueprint of the, Europe's, of the administration's Europe policy. In other words, if they wanted to have the meaning of the Brussels speech implained, explained, they should read Joram Hazoni, um, The Virtue of Nationalism. I don't know whether any of you have tracked that. Um, it's, um, I have seen an excerpt from it in the Wall Street Journal. You know, on a Sunday over breakfast, looked at this and thought, Jesus, what is this? You know, this is the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial board going sort of batshit crazy again. You know, dropped it. Then I heard the story, bought the book, and asked our library to get me to get me all the reviews that they could find um, since its publication. And I came back with a stack this fat. And they were all glowing reviews, and he's since received the Conservative Book of the Year Award, and he um, has just published another, speech, another piece which I would recommend to you last Sunday, Why We Need, Why America Needs New Alliances, together with another Israeli author. To explain, Yoram Hazoni is a, somebody I hadn't heard, heard before, I heard of before until, until <coughs> then. Um, he is the head of the Herzl Institute in, um, in Jerusalem, a um, little think tank, he is a historian and a political philosopher, and the virtue of nationalism is, I will, I mean, I'm going to be so very frank with you, I think is terrible political philosophy, and in as much as it is attempts to be an exegesis, particularly of European history, I think quite egregiously gets the facts of European history wrong. You know, it is quite easy to dismiss it on those two counts, but that would be a huge mistake, because what he does offer is an incredibly powerful narrative that connects the small o, small z, orthodox Zionism, with American evangelical fundamentalist political thought. And for that, I would urge you to read the book and also to read this recent piece in the Wall Street Journal. And basically what he says, and I, I wrote a piece about this in the FT if you want, that's the sort of short, the executive summary for the nervous of, of, uh, of what I'm about to say. Basically he says, um, empires are bad, nations are good. Um, there's two kinds of bad empires. One is liberal interventionist America, and the other one is the European Union. Um, he doesn't spend a lot of time with liberal interventionist America because he thinks that America under Trump is now on its way to self-reform and betterment because it has now rediscovered sovereignty and nationalism, but Europe and the EU in particular are the problem, not least because, and he seems to be obsessed with this, this is all a tool for Germany to reacquire uh, not just domination in Europe, but beyond it. 
Um, that, of course, is where, I mean, one, I think, uh, would be entitled to become a little alarmed. Um, the other thing about the, the, the interesting thing about his EU narrative is that he suggests that Western Europeans, and Germany in particular, are essentially holding other European countries hostage, particularly the Eastern Europeans, who have been so courted by this American administration. And what he suggests is that uh, Europe and European nations will only be free um, once the EU disappears and um, nations can be nations again. In other words, there is a, the, the, the idea here literally is that the clock is turned back, um, the EU as a framework disappears, and you find you, 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 you return to some sort of uh, notional uh, and, of course, historically uh, non-existence uh, version of, of national statehood. Um, it this never is, existed in Eastern Europe. Well, precisely, or, or nor in Western Europe for that matter, because we, we went down that route so quickly after the war. So this is an extraordinarily ahistorical suggestion, <coughs> but it appears to have an extraordinary amount of traction in Washington. Now, again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is, the, this is the party line of this administration. This is, I've got this one data point and the fact that this guy is being getting, you know, uh, is, is getting traction in the conservative press, is getting prizes and so on. I have a couple of other sort of conversations that I think match this. I think that this is a, I think that this is a good match, but it is not yet sort of the perfect explanation. What I am saying to you is that we need to understand that this take on Europe is afoot, and we need to have a narrative of ourselves that counters it. And I can say to you that I go to sort of all the roundtables and speeches by European diplomats and economists and whatnot who come to Washington, and I spend a lot of time traveling in Europe, and my overall assessment is, you know what, we are far from having that kind of narrative. Not just because we are still so concerned about our own domestic affairs, or about our own battles with populists, about our, with our fears of the European elections, but also because I think we've, we are genuinely struggling to find, a, to find a European unified voice. And even where we do find it, like on Iran, you know, it, that's, that is essentially a Franco-German-British, interestingly still, undertaking that the others let us do. But I, I think that we have not found, we, ha we have not been able to counter this particular thing. And I think if we're not able to do that, we have a real problem. It's our problem, in other words, not theirs. And we should be grateful for this, because this holds <coughs> up a mirror to us, which we may feel is distorting, but it does catch some of our nastier problems, doesn't it? And so I think that we are actually well advised to take this seriously, to take a look at it, and to think long and hard about what to do about it. I mean, I'm conscious of the passage of time, so I, will, I, can, I can certainly give you, give you links and literature recommendations. I'm not going to throw this at you, but it will, um, as only in particular, it's worth following on, on, on Twitter, um, because he seems to have a sort of distinct purpose with this, um, and I think is setting himself up as a political commentator on Europe and America, aren't you? Um, and this new article by him is interesting because it also takes on NATO, not just the EU, because it suggests that some allies are worth more than others and that if the, the Western Europeans in particular, and I will read you that actually, um, if the Western Europeans don't shape up, they should just be dropped. Um, let me read you this. A central question for a revitalized alliance of democratic nations is which way the winds will blow in Western Europe. The democratic nations point is interesting because he also proposes um, that, um, I mean, because he thinks Hung Hungary and Poland and its, uh, under its current government are, are, are good allies for America. Um, 
For a generation after the Berlin Wall's fall in 1989, US administration seemed willing to take responsibility for Europe's security indefinitely. European elites grew accustomed to the idea that perpetual peace was at hand, devoting themselves to turning the EU into a borderless utopia with generous benefits for all. This isn't wrong. But here's what, here's what comes next. Europe has been corrupted by its dependence on the US, comes a critique of Germany, world's fifth largest economic power, cannot field more than a handful of operational combat aircraft, etc., etc., guilty as charged. None of this is in America's interest, and not only because the US is stuck with the bill. When people live detached from reality, they develop all sorts of fanciful theories about how the world works. For decades, Europeans have been devising transnationalist fantasies to explain how their own supposed moral virtues, such as their rejection of borders, have brought them peace and prosperity. These ideas are then exported to the US and the rest of the democratic world via international bodies, universities, and so on, which is an extraordinary denial of America's role in the creation of multinational institutions and transnational norms. And Europe, exactly. It's now all a noxious influence coming from Europe. That I find quite remarkable. This is new. Having subsidized the creation of a dependent socialist paradise in Europe, the US now has to watch as the EU's influence washes over America and other nations. Okay. This is also the language of the hard right. It's the language of infection, of viruses, of the body, the perfect body being, being rendered impure. Okay. Um, it's, this is quite precise in the way it's articulated. For the moment, it is hard to see Germany or Spain becoming American, becoming American allies in the new, more realistic of the se a sense of the term we have proposed. France is a different case, yada yada. Prospects are better with respect to Britain. The UK may yet become a principal partner in a leaner but more effective security architecture for the democratic world. Well, there you, ha there you have it. Um, there are other authors in Washington whom you could read, and particularly the conservative think tanks, um, who write similar things. I am inclined to think that a lot of this is sort of aimed at, as I said, creating coalitions between Israel and America, between the fundamentalist and, 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 and orthodox Zionists. This is sort of, these are quite parochial interests at work. <coughs> But as you can see, the narrative that is being devised here is quite powerful, it's sticky, I think it's working, and it's toxic, and we don't have an answer to it. Now, we obviously have a couple of pressure points coming up for us which are now demanding a lot of our atten attention and political resources. For us in Europe, it's the EP elections at which the populists are uh, projected to gain between 30 and 40% of the EPCs, giving them not a blocking majority, but a distinct capability to gum up the works of governance and of legislation, and of course the selection of the executive in the EU, and thereby possibly undermining even further the effectiveness and the legitimacy of the European project. On the US side, we're already in the middle of the, of the campaign for 2020. And it's not clear to me at all at this point that the Democrats or actually other Republicans have a good, start, good, good chance in this election. Mm -hmm. Trump has turned out to be an extraordinarily powerful force, despite the fact that he is continually shedding responsible cabinet members and restrictions, maybe because of that. I mean, there is a distinct possibility that this administration will founder on, in a crisis of its own making because it is so clearly headed for a sort of quite fundamental conflict with the American system of constitutional governance. But it has survived so much so far that I, at this point, am sort of unwilling to place bets on that. And that we have an electoral clock that is inexorable. And the administration may well power on past that. 
So that's a depressing picture I've painted. I'm sorry. But um, I, I do this because I think that we need to understand the seriousness of the situation we find ourselves in. I think I see fixes to all this. I think I see people responding. I think I see, I see counter movements in our own in our own polities and societies, um, trying to grapple with our own vulnerabilities, which is where I think the which which I do think is the first order of the day, is fixing all the vulnerabilities and the problems that the populists exploit to undermine and destroy mainstream institutions and politics. But I do not think that we have the luxury of ignoring the viability and the health of the European project, or for that matter, the transatlantic alliance and world order, while we try and fix our domestic problems. That's where I'm going to leave you with. Again, it's not, it's not a happy note, um, but I think it's, this is quite literally the most serious um, crisis that I have seen in my working lifetime, not just of Western order, but of <coughs> democracy in, in Europe. And um, I think now is the time to stand up and fight for it. Thank you. Thank you.